A very good evening to one and all. A brief introduction of today's speaker, Dr. Father Anthony Da Silva. Father Tony Da, as he is affectionately called, is a Jesuit priest and presently the director of the Xavier Center of Historical Research in Porvori, Goa. By profession, he is a social scientist, having gained a PhD in social and personality psychology from the University of Michigan, USA. He has also taught extensively at the graduate and postgraduate levels in India and the USA. Additionally, he provides counseling services both as a Jesuit priest and as a professional psychologist. He was the provincial of the Goa Jesuits from 2005 to 2011. I have known Father Tonida personally, and I wish to mention here that Father Tonida is not only good at counseling, but has helped me with the preparation of the Latin diagnosis for the publication of a new plant species identified by me during my PhD in 2007. Father Anthony De Silva will be talking to us about grief and recovery counseling today and in the next four days. So let's make the most of what he has to offer to us. With these few words, I ask Dr. Father Anthony De Silva to take over. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, Father. OK. So good evening to everybody, at least those of you who are in India and uh, in other parts of the world, a good day. We are beginning this course today. And I am just returning from a memorial service where we have laid to rest one of our Jesuit priests who died yesterday and whose funeral was today. And I was thinking to myself, I'm going to spend some time with you all now, about an hour and a half. And I'm just returning from a grieving service, so to speak, where there were people, you know, grieving for Father Gregory Knight, who passed away perhaps known to some of you. And there were others who were perhaps a little more distant from him emotionally, but nevertheless connected with him and also grieving. And then there were the professionals, like the people working for the funeral services, etc., who perhaps are not grieving, but are certainly in a very somber mood reflecting the mood of the people around. So all of this, when one reflects, one sees that this grieving process that we are going to be speaking about is not simple. It is rather complex. <laughs> because it calls from within the human person a variety of emotions. Some of these emotions run into one another and create further complications for the grieving person or for the hurting person. So this very broad introduction, I think, is very essential for us to understand because grieving is such a common phenomenon for the human being. All humans grieve. Maybe they grieve differently. Maybe they grieve at different times. Maybe they grieve in different cultures. Some cultures allow one way of grieving and some another. All of that is also true. So it just indicates the complexity of the grieving phenomenon or the grieving process. 
This is, I believe, important to bear in mind because very often casually we say in observations we make that, for example, when there is a death in the family, that some who appear to us are not grieving or mourning very, very, uh, in a very striking manner. We think they are not grieving, but may not be true. They may be grieving, but in a silent way. They may be grieving, but in a withdrawn way. Or they may be grieving in a loud manner, really going out to the others and so on. So that this complexity, if we can touch upon during these days, I think it will help all of us. The recent experience of COVID, as we see, perhaps also as you may have experienced in your own uh, social life, in your own family life, in your own church life, or in your own workplace where some of your colleagues died due to COVID, has brought about a variety of reactions and a variety also of reflections as to what grief is all about. I do not believe, and let us get this clear right at the outset, that any one of us has the answer to what grieving is all about. Or we have a clear-cut formula. This is how one is supposed to grieve. There is no such thing. We will talk about it as we go along. But these little bit of cautionary remarks, I think, are important in the beginning so that we do not think that by attending sessions like these, which I think are very, it's a great idea and they're very useful, that we will automatically find the solutions that we have been awaiting that we will find some enlightenment. True, I think we will be enlightened a little more. We might develop a little more understanding of what is going on within us if we are grieving or within others with whom we interact. That is quite likely and quite possible. So can we move to the next slide? Okay. So we are understanding grief and grieving. We're making an attempt to understand. In spite of all these cautionary notes that I sounded to you. And I thought maybe to put things in perspective and to help you a little bit to reflect better or to make a few notes that you can revisit later on. We could first run through these three questions maybe just today and maybe tomorrow. Let's see how it goes, how much time is needed. But I think what we shall do during these sessions, we'll follow this model that I've spoken to the webmaster about, and he will help us with it. For about 30 minutes, I shall input a little bit of input, some reflections, some psychological insights, some religious, spiritual insights, some psychosocial insights, you know, whatever the science that suggests to us. And after 30 minutes, we shall take in some questions from you, or I shall attempt to answer them for about 15 minutes. So that gives us an interactive pattern. And then again, another 30 minutes, we shall get into another theoretical model. And then again, once again, 15 minutes for the audience to raise questions or some of their own reflections and so on. Okay? So we shall try this model. It is the 30, 15, 30, 15 model. Okay? So that way we will utilize our 90 minutes, hopefully in a productive manner, and you will feel at the end of 90 minutes that you have gained something, at least a few, few insights in human behavior. So to begin with, what is grief? This kind of a question. Can we go to, yes, here the slide shows us. What is grief? By and large, we in common conversation might not use the word grief often, but now it is becoming a lot more 
uh, in usage. But maybe we use words like, I have lost something. I'm experiencing a loss. And therefore, every loss, because we lose something, we feel certain amount, the loss brings about a certain amount of feeling of grief. I feel sorry or I grieve about what I lost. So it is associated a lot with loss. Of course, the clear example is the loss in debt. When we speak of somebody who died, that we lost somebody, a friend or a spouse or a child or a friend or whatever. Okay, that loss obviously reflects and that is what causes us grief. This experience is really, I would say, primal to the human being. Because this experience, we have to go back to our birth. Already the infant experiences this as birth. Where the, ex where the experience is, the infant is, so to speak, expelled, if I may use this word right now, but you, you will understand, from the womb into the world, comes into another world. So it has lost quite a lot in this process. It has lost its comfort zone in the womb. It's lost, lost its warmth in the womb, its control lighting in the womb or whatever atmosphere that made it comfortable. And so there is a certain degree of loss. And so the child comes out and there is an experience almost of a trauma at birth because suddenly there's a new environment. Many of the things that infant was accustomed to or the fetus is no longer there and has to make a transition now into a different world. It's good for us to think about that. It's a primal experience, I think, because this is the model that is going to run through our lives from that day of birth until this day of death. Whenever it's going to be, repeatedly, we will have this model happening in our lives. The losses, obviously, are of different intensities, of different categories, because they take place in different environments, at different ages, and so on and so forth. I don't have to spell out all of that in detail, but you understand. But the experience of loss, or psychologically we call it the experience of separation anxiety, takes place. This separation anxiety is more visible in some situations, most visible perhaps in human death, where literally there is separation. Literally the person dying will be separated, will be buried or will be cremated or will be however disposed of and it is final in that loss this person will not come back to you will come back to you maybe at another level maybe at a spiritual level but we are not entering that right now but it is a definitive a final loss and it's a very severe loss sometimes more than others but understand uh, my dear friends that this phenomenon of loss, this anxiety that we have, is a phenomenon that we are born with. It comes with our birth already. And this is repeated throughout life. So therefore, you know, and I have cited here in this slide that you are seeing in the second bullet there, Loss can be seen in death. Loss can be seen in reputation of your name or your reputation or your loss of your name, loss of your financial loss, loss of a partner in life, like in a divorce situation, not only in death, but in separation. So, I mean, we are familiar with this, really. And it also amazes me as a social scientist and my colleagues also at graduate school and you know, others that we use when we used to deal with these topics, that such a commonplace experience like grieving and loss, and we have really no very clear 
insights to explain these things in the counseling situation. It becomes quite a difficult situation to handle in counseling. Because I, as I said to you in the beginning, losses are a variety of losses. And the diversity itself is so rich that the answers that the psychologist and the those who are specializing in grieving therapy and so on, you know, have to come up with is sometimes extremely difficult and needs a lot of very slow processing. Loss also creates this kind of, in the third bullet point there, uh, creates a void, you know, this kind of a hole, because you've lost, as common sense tells us, when we lose something, it leaves a void. You know, now, whenever a human person and in the psyche there is a void, mostly the void creates pain, it creates hurt, it creates grief, if you like. So this is the kind of, you know, explanation that may help us a little bit to understand the complexity of grief, although it is commonplace, although every one of us experiences grief, irrespective of age, irrespective of education, irrespective of gender, you know, irrespective of wealth, anything, it is, it is simply something that irons out the human family on this level on the level of loss everybody understands across cultures so this is about loss and grief and bear in mind because we may come back to this idea and you can also raise some questions about how this loss can be quite primal right from the day of birth can we move on to the next slide What, what is grief? I think that is the next slide. Okay. Anyway, do you read the slide? Why do we grieve? Okay. Why do we grieve? The simplest explanation is because something is broken within me. As I said, something is lost. There's a void perhaps created sometimes. So this concept of brokenness that we use in ordinary uh, literature, you know, the broken person, we say after a traumatic experience, a tragic experience or however. So it is literally true, actually. Something breaks within us. Something breaks in the psyche. This brokenness is what we explore normally in the counseling situation. How it has come about, what is the experience, how does it manifest itself, and so on and so forth, you know, that we do, all counselors do. I'm sure those of you who are involved in this kind of uh, occupation, a ministry or profession are familiar with. But I like this notion to keep in mind that loss, grief is related or correlated to brokenness. Why do I say this? Because we also know that in the concept of brokenness is inherent the concept of cure, of healing. What is broken can be repaired. When we say it can be repaired, in psychological jargon, it can be healed, or in the medical world, it can be healed. So it gives a tremendous sense of hope, this kind of an attitude, this kind of uh, thinking pattern. And so therefore, I think it is good to bear in mind to ask and explore with your counselor, what is broken? From what brokenness is this grief coming? Can we talk about it a little bit? Can we explore a little bit? Can we see where is this brokenness located in my psyche, in my social behaviors, and so on and so forth? 
because someone or something as says in the second bullet is missing a person a love object or something dear to you like a job which is very important and very valuable so when because something like that goes missing so to speak can be one thing is broken another thing it can go missing there is also hope again in this kind of formulation that what is missing could be recovered what is broken could be repaired this is the kind of terminology now that is becoming so current in in uh, in the social sciences and especially in these kinds of human behavior analysis because these are signs of great hope when we say that something is missing now i'm missing my loved one that means i can perhaps find some amount of compensation and make up for this missing thing what is missing can be found can i find something else some other person or some other object or whatever so as i say in the third bullet there because we yearn to repair the loss we also we grieve because we hurt so as you see these concepts are all very closely interconnected they are very correlated and this is a reflection of the human person's emotional world that however much i put things up for you like this and you know that you are all professional people sitting there and listening to me you know how we do these things in order to explain better to our students to the young ones or to the senior ones or whoever our audience may be and in that effort that we make as i am doing now to explain so that people may understand i'm afraid sometimes we sort of over simplify what is going on within the human psyche because we categorize things nicely in four steps or so many stages and so many phases or whatever and yet that is also essential i am not poo-pooing that and dismissing it i myself you know come up the, the graduate school way like all of you and so all of us know this it is essential it is part of our uh, educational training process but i think it's a, also a good reminder that we cannot compartmentalize this phenomenon of grief however good we may be at explaining this on the blackboard that therefore we have the answers but i think these explanations brokenness of missing of ability to repair of grief that for we heard are notions that are extremely useful for us because the more we understand these things the better we can come to the next phases as we will do in the days ahead how do we cope with these situations what would be our coping responses to these situations but this is yet to come but i'm just kind of uh, giving you a hint that we will revisit some of these concepts as we get closer to the idea of how do we heal the brokenness and how do we find that what is missing can we move on to the next slide how do we grieve i hinted to you earlier that grieving however much we may speak in generalities is not a concept really that is to be applied to everybody in the same manner this would be a very grievous mistake we would make and therefore i put in the first bullet over there there is no such thing as one size fits all as you find in the supermarkets 
or you find on Amazon.com or wherever else you may go to search for your clothing or to search for whatever you're looking for that can be kind of generic. The concept is generic, but the response is diverse. This is important to bear in mind. The experience is generic. Indeed, all of us experience grief. There is no question about it. And it would be absurd for us to spend time even discussing that because all of us experience it. There's nothing to discuss. It is our human experience. But what we have to talk about and listen to one another and learn from each other is the differences, the variety of what we call in statistical psychology, the variance of human behavior, the variance. Because there is the richness. And in this richness also lies the secret of our response. What kind of a response, what kind of coping we will come up with because based on the response also is the coping and vice versa. Based on the coping is also the kind of response. So just to bear in mind this little concept that there is no one size fits all type thing. So we grieve differently. You just have to look around your own neighborhood, you're among your own friends. Immediately you realize this, you know, that the very grieving process is complex and rich. And therefore, you know, we have to pause for a little bit in order to understand. We have to pause for a little bit so that we formulate a response that is meaningful to us and not a response that Tony is telling you about or not a response that the textbooks only are giving us. I think because what I'm trying to say is ultimately the response is within us and we have to discover it. We have to, if you like, uncover it because it is within us. So bear in mind this friends, you know, that we grieve differently because it has serious implications. If we grieve differently, then we have to understand the grieving person also differently. You follow what I mean? We cannot apply the same standards to, let's say, in a family, they're grieving. And you say, oh, some of them are not grieving, really. They don't care about this person who is dead. And, you know, they are going on, carrying on with life. And, you know, these remarks that are made very flippant and sometimes not very helpful. But, you know, that indicates to me they have not appreciated what each one of us goes through, this difference, this richness in the grieving process, and therefore the richness of finding good responses. Let's just move on to the next uh, uh, bullet on that category, the second one. Some loud and some grieve silently, as we know very well, in our own neighborhoods. In India, it's a great example. In Western countries, maybe the greater emphasis has been on grieving silently. You know, people don't mourn loudly. But in India, it's not uncommon. I don't see in all the communities in India, no. But surely we see among the various communities different modes of grieving. Some withdraw, others become proactive because they feel by becoming proactive, they kind of get distracted or something. They remove themselves from that experience. And they feel, you know, if I remove myself from the experience, then, you know, I'm done with grieving, so to speak. And our point today in the world of psychology don't be in a hurry to get done with grieving. Don't look upon grieving as an evil, as a bad thing. Grieving is an experience. 
Therefore, we'll come to that a little more in detail later. You know, we have to see what is the good that I can get from the grieving process. And there is definitely something. And we will see what kind of method might be helpful. But just bear that in mind. So some withdraw. Some are very proactive. Some are passive. Others are aggressive. As we know also, it's very difficult sometimes uh, after death in a family to approach certain people. They become very nasty or aggressive or, or whatever. You know, they are not pleasant anymore. And sometimes most unpleasant to the other grieving members in the family which complicates the dynamic even more. But uh, we shall have to see how that is. Some are accepting of whatever has caused the grief. Others are protesting and saying, where is God? For example, if you're a religious person and you believe in religious values, this is a frequent thing we who are in the priesthood hear from people who are very upset. And where is God? And why have you come here bringing this kind of a message which is irrelevant? And my child is just dying. And you telling me this? Is that all you got to say? What kind of a God is that? And so on, which we have heard. I'm sure all of you have heard. You don't have to be a priest to hear this. But it is a human struggle, indicative of our struggle. It is not that people are bad and they have to be condemned for that reason. But it is this human struggle. Because ultimately, as you are seeing, I hope by now, that I'm heading in the direction of concluding with you that grief, like many other phenomena in the human behavior and in the human psyche, is a mystery. Some aspect of it is a mystery. Yes, you might have the best of psychology texts and you might have, you know, gone to the web and read all kinds of things, which is fantastic. But ultimately, each person has to deal with this reality. And therefore, it is a mystery. In a way, it has this mystical tone to it. That is why a lot of people turn to spirituality and religion. Because spirituality and religion speak this kind of language, which perhaps the medical, psychological, and other professions do not. Because they consider themselves empiricists, scientists, who have to measure things, and who have to give you test figures and say you are normal, or you are above normal, and so on. And this is the way the sciences have progressed by measuring human behavior. But I'm afraid when it comes to grief, like when it comes to love also, not only grief, but there are certain human emotions that we can get a sense of, but we really cannot measure and I think grief is one of those. We all experience grief, as I said to you earlier. But we really do not know what is really going on. The mystery part of grief is also to be cherished in a way. But it means like all mysteries, it means it has to be processed. And for that, we may need help. Help from members of the family, help from friends, help from support groups, maybe help from specialists who are specialized in grief counseling and so on. But processing sometimes is very helpful. Now, not many people or not everybody goes to professionals. But surely, you know, we know how we, even in the villages, I'm talking about India where I have experience of living in villages with people who experience trauma, sometimes floods, sometimes death, sometimes disease like COVID right now that is really 
rampaging the country and so on. You know, they also have to cope. They might not have gone to school. They might not have great degrees and may not have seen the world, but they have seen loss. Loss is not new to the poor and to the rich. So they try to cope. And so this, I think, is an important element that we have to realize. And although the experience is commonplace, and in fact, nobody is spared this experience, nobody. Everybody grieves. Nobody can tell me in the audience, I don't know what you're talking about. What is this grief thing you're going about with? It's impossible. You might call it something else, use another word. You might label it differently. That's another matter. We're not quarreling about labels. We are talking about human experience of loss. And therefore, this loss has to be repaired. It has to be made whole. You know, we have to become wholesome again. So in the third uh, uh, bullet there, and the fourth, I will end, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. I see I've gone 15 minutes beyond. But I just wanted to complete these ideas for you, and I want to hear from you whether you're finding them helpful or, you know, I'm further causing you further grief. I hope not. So we grieve differently because the causes of grief are different. So even in a thing like death, you know that from experience. We see different forms of grief. Now, I said to you, I have just come back from a funeral of my dear friend, Father Gregory, perhaps known to some of you, a Jesuit priest, older man. He died at the age of 88. Very good life, very healthy. Only in the last few months he suffered. Uh, and that too, not very severe suffering that needed hospitalization. No, we took care of him at home. So he died a relatively what we would call in this day and age, relatively peaceful death, which is wonderful. But I also said to you, you know, it was interesting for me now that I was coming to this class, I was just observing the people there. For some, this separation and loss for his sisters and so on, you know, was very severe because after all, they're the sisters, after all, they're in the same age group as compared to perhaps younger members of the family, you know, who perhaps did not have such a strong affiliation and emotional ties with the deceased person. And so obviously the phenomenon is the same, death. But the losses are processed differently. The, if the losses are processed differently, the responses also are different. So see the sophistication of what I'm trying to lead you into, you know, so that we learn, you know, to respect our emotions. We learn from one another how these different reactions take place and therefore different responses, because the causes also of this death might be different. Surely when you go to a funeral where there is, for example, a death from accident, the grief is also of a different kind. You can see that immediately because it is so unexpected. Oftentimes the accident victims are young, but most of the time the grief comes because of the shock element, because of the suddenness element, because of the lack of preparation for this event. Nobody expected an accident, obviously, but it takes place. And so your grieving responses also are different. And the processing that will take place when we go home over the next few weeks and months and years, surely. Finally, the last bullet there is culture, religion, social status. All of these things also shape our grief. How we grieve also both the grief and the manner of grieving. You know, as I said to you earlier, cultures in India, you know, some encourage loud mourning, some expect loud mourning. If there is no loud mourning, 
they do not believe that you're experiencing loss and there is some problem with you and your family and your people or whatever you know and so there is this type of a thing also social status you know some people think high status people should not show their emotions after all you know i'm high status highly educated lots of money you know wealthy person whatever whatever we behave you know controlled manner all emotions are kept under check and so on is it good i don't know we have to talk to these people and see what you experience but sometimes we are influenced by this by what you're belonging to a particular status group i sort of follow the status norms and if the norms say oh we don't cry loudly like this in front of people you know we grieve silently in sobs or whatever manner i don't know but i'm just imagining but yes this is the reality so the shape you know of how we grieve depends very much on this so it is good in our grief reflections and not to hesitate in your questions and in your reflections also to point out to me how culture religions different religions also have modes of grieving because different religions have their own fixed responses to death so christianity for example christianity by and large up to recent times had one response to that of how we deal with death i mean after the person has died is for example burial that is the ritual you put the man or the woman back into the earth then they will quote to you the holy scriptures and say you have come from the earth and you go back to the earth because the belief is that adam came from the earth and eve and you go back into the earth so you complete a cycle Hinduism advocates, as you know very well, cremation. There is nothing to save and to put into the earth. You cremate, and the spirit then moves and reincarnates, and so on. There are different theories. Islam also buries. So whatever it is, but religions also influence it. So if I belong to a particular religion, obviously my family is not going to do something. that is counted to the religion after i die so they will bury me according to those rituals unless i leave specific instructions saying that i do not want it done this way or that but that causes also other grief problems within the family is that process is he really complete is the death really complete or we should have done these rituals which our family has always done now they have broken this tradition and so So good. I'll pause here. We have done forty-five minutes, I believe, and we'll take fifteen minutes to get some little bit of feedback from you. Some questions you want to raise. Feel very welcome to protest and say I do not agree with what you're saying. That's it. You know, let's talk about it and let all of us contribute and improve and help one another to understand this phenomenon. Open to you. i think the webmaster will control this from his uh, from his cabin yeah if anybody has any kind of questions they can unmute themselves and uh, ask father or if you all have uh, like any any problems which you all want to consult to him also if you all are okay asking it uh, publicly then you all can unmute yourselves and talk to him Hi, hi. This is Anushka. Hi, Anushka. Uh, father, I had a question. In the beginning of the slide, you had said that uh, grieving means that you are broken and it's a let out, right? No, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I cannot hear too well. One second. Huh? Let me see. If I can increase this volume here. Yeah. Say say again, Anushka. I'm sorry. Yeah, am I audible now, Father? Yes, very audible. Very audible. Yes. Uh, my question was that you had said that grieving we grieve because we are 
broken. Is it truly that we are broken or it's the sense of brokenness that we feel? Obviously, it's a sense of brokenness. Well said, well said. It's a sense of brokenness, but the sense of brokenness will not come by itself, no? Anoshka, it is also the experience of brokenness. So that means, yeah, to experience brokenness, I have to be broken. You know, there's something has hit me. Something has uh, disturbed me, or however you want to say this, no? So, yeah. unless you have got a finer distinction? Uh... I, I wouldn't say a distinction, but in my perspective, we uh, being broken and having a sense of brokenness are quite distinct in nature. Because if we are broken, then there's hope that's lost. And with a sense of brokenness, it's just that you are whole, but you can feel a sense of brokenness through your trauma. You know, and there is a possibility of Rupert. hope that you know, it's not really dead. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Makes good sense. What you're trying to say is also what I'm. Uh, I was struggling to express, perhaps, is that this brokenness, if you like to call it that, is a uh, is a concept of hope. That's what you're saying. I'm gathering, and I am very much of that opinion also. Because the experience of brokenness is vulnerability, really. It shows us our vulnerability, which can be overcome. That's it. Is there anybody else got a comment? I don't think the media is having questions. What's the best way to say to someone who is grieving? Like, what is condolence? Well, condolence, uh, as far as I can uh, figure out, is we it is perhaps a psychological word for that perhaps closest would be we try to empathize with the person we try to enter into the other person's feelings emotions by condoling if you like the social word that is used so we as much as we can but because as i pointed out to you repeatedly you know, because of the complexity of the inner life of the human person, particularly when the person is troubled like this or traumatized or going through a particularly hard patch in life. In those situations, you know, it's very difficult to know what is the right kind of response. So we condole, in general, we say, you know, I am with you in this thing. I'm not sure I understand what is going on within you because this is a momentary thing. I enter your house and condole with you and meet you for 30 seconds, maybe hold your hand or say a word or something. But I think it's an indication that I'm with you. We are supportive. We are there. All of these are very helpful social signals that we send to persons who are in grief. We are not necessarily solving their problem. I don't think so. But I think it's very important that we as social beings, that we also communicate that I can empathize with you. I can feel with you because I also go through stuff like this. May not be now at this moment when I'm condoling as much as when I also have similar experiences, you know, that's why I come now to condole with you and to say, okay, I understand. Not necessarily I have the solution, but I reach out to you. 
is this making sense? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Um, may I speak? Sure. Uh, you know, I'm sorry I missed the session because of a personal problem in between. But uh, now, uh, just catching the bull by the tail, if grief is equal to brokenness uh, and a question of hope intermingled in that, for me, grief was blank. And I just needed time to myself and for myself to be present to the grief. A person is gone. I hope that person enjoys eternal rest. But never did it come to me about hope. Hope for what? And I think the worst thing that I went through was that I just didn't have time in that grief to be present to the grief. I'm sorry I missed the earlier part, but like uh, one of the ladies asked you, uh, what is the best way, uh, you know, each of us is different. Sure. And I think just in silence, if someone held my shoulder, because we can only empathize with the person when we have gone through the situation. So I hope I can see the recording of today's talk. But I just wanted to express that in that grief, it's like a vacuum. And for me, the thought of hope never came to my mind until one day in a spiritual encounter, I surrendered the person. And I thanked God for taking away that person. I'm sharing something very personal. But I've been wanting to handle and deal with my grief. I'm sorry if I'm going out of text. But it was very, very important. And this uh, program was God sent to me. Thank you, Father. I don't know if I'm clear about what I'm speaking. Welcome. May I we I mean, will touch upon this notion of hope because it's one of the responses to grief is because grief can be so shattering sometimes people kind of despair if you like this is a rather strong word but you know so in other words hope diminishes tremendously and the counter to that is to encourage hope and what the other lady also said, by empathizing, or oh, you use the word condoling, but uh, you know any support like that also brings nourishes hope in the person going through a bad patch or going through the suffering and so on and so forth. A little bit like what Anoshka said also earlier, this brokenness, you know, that means it could be put together again, so to speak. It gives us hope, like I also was saying earlier. And therefore, religions in their responses, all religions across the board, in their responses to this mystery of death, you know, push very much the message of hope. Although you can question that and say, you know, one could question it and say, hope for what you know i mean i'm going through hell here and what hope are you talking about but you know hope is futuristic hope is hope you know it creates expectations of a better experience you know? so in a way it's very energizing it could be very energizing very building up and so on and so forth yeah thank you thank you father sure sure thank you thank you for your sharing very personal very touching. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Urmila Barros, um, I would like to tell you, we'll be like we have recorded the whole uh, webinar, and we'll yes. be uploading it on YouTube, and I'll send you the link. Like I'll send the link to each and every participant. Yeah. Thank Plus, you. Thank you so much. That would be very good. Thank you. Plus, uh, as discussed with Father, I think in the last two days we'll be having personal uh, talks, right, Father? Yes. Wherein, we will not uh, 
we will cease giving these lectures or whatever public talks. So two days we are dedicating for personal, uh, which the webmaster will set up. He will explain it better than I. I don't, yeah. I don't have access to that. So wherein one-on-one -on -one conversation will be uh, between uh, Father uh, Tony and the person who is grieving. Like it, it will be a kind of counseling wherein the uh, other participants will not be involved. Only these two people will be talking and those sessions will not be recorded. So please, you can discuss your own personal problems and talk to Father. Uh, Father, we have a few questions in the chat box. I'll read it out to you. Okay. Uh, Marietta Rodriguez, she she's asking, is there a right or wrong way of grieving? Example, a person who protests or blame others for the death of a loved one. Yeah, there is a, strictly speaking, no right or wrong way, but they could be wrong way in the sense that uh, we cannot go and accuse somebody else, you know, like blame somebody else for my grief because I don't know one has to see the situation you cannot give an, again a generic answer but the first part of the, of the statement is correct uh, Marietta namely that you know because grief is so complex as I have been repeating over and over again you know there is no really one right or wrong answer but no point in creating an answer that would uh, do wrong to somebody, you know, by accusing somebody of something. Or something. I'm not sure it is going to alleviate the guilt that one is feeling by doing such a thing. I'm not so sure. Because that lets loose another set of dynamics, you know, of animosity and, you know, aggressivity and so on and so forth. Okay, the next question is by Audrey. Okay. She is asking, is it possible to grieve for something without realizing what you're grieving for? Well, it is possible, obviously, that sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes we ask this question casually of our friends and uh, why are you sad? What are you sad about? You know, sort of closest to grieving, uh, you know, apart from death and all. And sometimes you get this kind of an answer, I don't know, but I just feel sad. I just feel, you know, sort of different. I can't put my finger on it. Now, this grieving that we have been speaking about this evening is more connected with knowing of some kind of a loss factor that has taken place, whether it is death of a person or loss of a job or a disease, uh, contracting some serious disease or going through COVID anxiety, you know, all these kinds of things. So these are, but theoretically, this question, whether you can feel grief without knowing what it's about, would perhaps indicate that there might be some underlying cause which needs to be explored, which needs to be studied a little bit and, uh, you know, with a counselor or with somebody accompanying you, because sometimes these things lay buried also. And childhood experiences and stuff like that might have been very sometimes grieving experiences that have been buried under. And we are not very aware of. And so to create that awareness of those experiences, one would need some help, obviously to bring them up to the fore. But uh, we think it's very useful, very useful to become familiar with what is going on. Within. So I don't know whether this is helpful to you, Audrey, but this is, at least for the time being, this is what I could say briefly. Uh, Frederick Norona is asking, Yes. of COVID, with a tsunami of deaths, are there any different coping mechanisms what coping mechanisms in times of covid with a tsunami of deaths okay many uh, deaths took place so are there any different coping mechanisms yes in the sense that you know as i was saying earlier tsunami 
like COVID and some of these things, you know, there is that suddenness factor. It's like an accident, you know, tsunami just comes and well, of course you might have a warning from the government that you're going to get a tsunami coming down your coast, coastal road and stuff like that. But uh, still we, do, we cannot pinpoint what, what might happen. And so the suddenness factor, you know, what we call shock factor or this kind of what it does to persons of the tsunami floods is there is a numbness that is created a psychological numbness you know okay i'll just give some examples and perhaps might help a little bit you may have seen on television in the last uh, two three weeks so last month this uh, situation of sudden floods in germany on the river Rhine. Those of you who have been to Germany may be familiar. Okay, so this is unheard of in Germany. And uh, they never had floods. And in that area, particularly, never. And the river Rhine has never flooded there, and so on and so forth. So all these factors came out uh, in the analysis. And so the 170 people died. So the village and the community around was simply shocked, you know. They could not believe. I mean, how could this happen? It has never happened. And generations have lived beyond the banks of the Rhine, and so on and so forth. All these kinds of arguments were brought. But the reaction, as you are pointing out, Frederick, is one of numbness in the beginning, because they were so shocked. They could not believe. And also, much of the rest of the world could not believe, because they never heard Germany getting floods. We get floods. You know? So I wrote to some of my German friends, you know, as my, earlier one of you said, condoling, so to speak, said, I'm really sorry, I see these pictures on television. We are not accustomed to seeing Germany like this, you know, in such a bad state. And he wrote back saying to me, you know, neither are we. We Germans are shocked. He's saying these pictures are from the third world. You know, this is where these things happen in Africa and Asia and, you know, third world. They can't go with, uh, with nature. Never happened. So see this denial taking place, you know, immediately a denial. So it is only a day or two later, you know, after a certain amount of calmness had come back there, that responses started to be formulated to that flood. People started to say, come on now, we have to do something. We have to rebuild. We have to, uh, and the government came in and gave them money and uh, people, other people came in and helped and so on and so forth. But earlier there was numbness, which is shock. Just come to the Indian situation, tsunami. I don't know, we were involved, you know, as Jesuits to get involved in many of these kinds of things. We had these tsunami experiences some years back, as you may remember. Christmas Day and so on and so forth in the in South India and so on. It was devastating. And uh, many of the younger Jesuits went there to work, and I was very interested in uh, talking to them about their experiences of this tragedy and of this. Uh, you know, what did the people feel? And they were telling me this kind of experience of numbness. They were shocked. That these huge waves came at them and just wiped out their hutments and whatever was on the coastline, etc. And they were totally shocked. But interestingly, the Indian response, I just want to point out, point this out to you, was get these volunteers who have come from other parts of India, let them help us. We are helpless. You know, they sort of went into the shock, and their response was helplessness. That means the numbness that overtook them, the shock was so great, their behavior patterns were frozen, they got paralyzed. They, they could not think as this German group, uh, the German villages, they said, come on, we have to reconstruct, let's do it, let other people come and help us and we'll do it with them. Here the response by and large, not everybody, but by and large in the Indian situation was, these volunteers have come. Let them do it. You know, we are going to the camps and we'll stay in the camps and they will bring us food and they will bring us water and we will be in the camp. And so in India, many times these tragedies, they lead to a completely new life. Like people start living in camps and give up control over their own lives. 
then it becomes very difficult to formulate a response that is meaningful to tragedy, to tsunamis, as Frederick is asking. I don't know if I'm making sense, Frederick, but you know. So even there, we ask this question in the social science uh, uh, places. It's like, why is our response so passive? But maybe we have got another philosophy of life. And the philosophy of life, as we would hear oftentimes in these tsunami affected areas or earthquake affected areas or wherever terrible devastation, is you know, this is our this is our lot. This is our you know God's will, or I don't know whose will, but you know, this is it for us, you know. So we have to live with it and learn to live with it. Sort of that kind of a reaction. So there is a little bit of that that comes into play of all these situations. Moving on to the next question by Daniela Fernandez. Yeah. It says, hello, Father, from a counselor's perspective, how do you con condole a client? Sometimes telling a client that you understand how they feel or by telling them that you do have gone through the same aspects in your life may make them defensive. How do you help a client in this instance? You know, that one has to be really cautious, you know, of when it, the psychologist that all of you are trained in psychology know that very well. Uh, you know, we do not insert ourselves in the therapeutic process, the counselor, with his or her experiences. Freud himself, Sigmund Freud, did a great father of psychoanalysis was very careful therefore he wanted all the students themselves to be psychoanalyzed first so that they know their own weaknesses and strengths and don't project it onto your client so there is a little bit danger of that a little bit at least and it's good for us to be aware who are trying to help others not to quickly say yeah yeah i also had that experience because what we think happens sometimes is the client feels you're belittling the client's experience and trumping it with your own, you know what I mean? So you might not have this intention. You might be trying to just, trying to compare the two or try, trying to say, okay, I mean, I'm close to you, I understand what you're going through and so on and so forth. But uh, one has to be a little cautious, yeah. But I think that's important. So my own experience has been, I rather hear out the client whatever he or she has got to say, and, you know, at great length, sometimes repetitive, very often repetitive, and you might say, oh my God, I have heard this. That's okay, you know, that's part of the cycle, being repetitive, because it helps the person to overcome this trauma or whatever, yeah. But uh, not to inject oneself uh, too hurriedly into that process. That's been my experience at least. Yeah, anything else? Yeah, next question by Daniela Fernandez. She's asking, is it healthy to try to forget the grief and bury it and leave it and uh, leave it as it is and move forward? Does it have any psychological impact on the other parts and areas of a person's life if the grief is being buried? Yeah, you abuse this term, you know, that common people use and common persons so what but the, what uh, we think might be happening is you know what Sigmund Freud also talks about in psychoanalysis and other professionals is repression you know if we repress negative experiences negative emotions you know repressions you know we kind of press them down into the unconscious try to bury them in the unconscious of the person. We think now from experience and therapy and also lots of literature in this field, is that what is repressed or you know, buried in the unconscious also expresses itself. All repressions are expressions, are expressed eventually. Maybe they're expressed in dreams Maybe they are expressed in other human behaviors like aggressivity or, you know, withdrawal or depression or many other things. Could be, I'm not saying always, but could be. Therefore, 
what do we encourage? Obviously, we encourage, you know, that we deal with whatever the trauma is, the difficulty is, deal with it as much as we can, rather than repress, or I have used the word repress, the lady used the word, you know, bury or suppress or however a casual word we want to use. But the meaning, I think, is, I mean, what they're trying to get at is very similar. Because we are, th we think now more and more, burying stuff into the unconscious, you know, because the unconscious also has its own dynamic. The unconscious throws up things suddenly into the conscious level. So you suddenly have to deal with, suddenly it comes, we say in ordinary English, it's coming back to me now, this thing. I thought I had dealt with it. It's coming back in my sleep or in somebody reminded me, or I don't know, however, it, it gets triggered off, so to speak. And it comes into the conscious level. And then we have difficulty coping with it because we have not dealt with it in the first place. So coping becomes difficult. We had buried it and thought by burial the problem was solved, but not necessarily. Not necessarily difficult to f forget like the way we think you know forget about it is our common phrase but in reality it's not so easy to forget especially hurt feelings especially traumatic experiences we may not speak about them that is possible we can practice that kind of discipline don't talk to me about these things okay tell my wife or tell my children or whatever I think uh, you see this quite commonly among alcoholics. Don't talk to me about this. You know, I will handle this. You know. Just don't want to admit denial. All of this goes together. Denial, repression, you know, forgetting, whatever. This makes sense. I hope I'm making some sense to you folks. Yes, indeed, Kata. Okay. So, Audrey says, thank you uh, for your uh, explanation. That was very insightful. Okay, can we now uh, just do a little bit of input and then it'll be time for you to go for your dinner? Yeah, fine, fine. No problem. There were three, three more questions, uh, two more questions. Yeah, we can take up the questions tomorrow, maybe. Yeah, yeah, fine, no problem. I'll record it and keep it so that tomorrow you can, while starting the talk itself, we can take these questions. Okay. Because I'll just do this one slide. I think uh, it'll maybe complete things on, you know, on this topic that we have been trying to. Yes, but I'll do. Shall we do this last slide and then you folks can call it a night? Yeah, thank you. Okay, we have, I just wanted to introduce you to this concept, which also for me is relatively new, but maybe you folks are a lot younger than I am, and maybe you have read about this. But it's, I find this very interesting, because this is uh, the experience of us who've been in this kind of uh, work for decades, that you sort of uh, come across all the time. But it was not addressed very much. No, I'm finding younger psychologists and scientists are addressing this, which is very nice. And I wanted just to share with you a few things so that you can benefit from this. <clears throat> what is called the concept of complicated grief. You know, before we used to have an idea that yes, death has taken place or some trauma. And you know, you'll get over it, you know, in one week, two weeks, maybe one month. You know, the churches also, the religions also, Try to help a little bit by having months mind. For example, if you're Roman Catholic, you will be familiar with this concept, you know. But if you're coming from a different faith, maybe they don't have this kind of a concept. But you know, a month's mind, a death anniversary, you know, time to recall things, to pray, or on November two to go to the cemetery and remember the dead people and so on. These kinds of things were being done 
by churches supporting these practices, which are very helpful, I think, to people who are struggling with their emotions, particularly of grief. But this concept of complicated grief, you know, is what I have hinted at already earlier when we were speaking, you know, is kind of prolonged grief, perhaps it's a more appropriate word, I feel, than complicated. It is because it is prolonged, it is complicated, and vice versa, because it is complicated, it gets prolonged. Of course, they're both related. But, you know, this kind of prolonged grief, people experience grief for a long while, many months, sometimes years, you know. But they have not repressed it, you know, like some people had earlier asked the question, can I just bury it and move on in life? I think today we would be reluctant to encourage people to do that. That people that all of us want to move on is, is fine, you know, and that is true. But uh, we should not pay that kind of a price in order to move on, be very something in a hurry. And so complicated grief is a good reminder to us that sometimes, sometimes, grief can be complex. And it will take time. And it will need time. And you will have to give it time. You know, it's not wasted time. But before we used to think it's wasted time and people would say, come on, come on, move on, move on in life, you know. What are you grieving about this person who died or so many years now, one, two years and so on. Again, it depends on that type of grief, on that type of event that the grieving is about. Because the complication comes not from the grief side strictly, but it's coming from the event the force of the event. If the event is very powerful and very forceful, then obviously the reaction and the response of grief is also gets very complex. Okay? So painful emotions are long lasting and severe. It's complex. Because they last long and they are severe, they also might be liable to do damage to your inner psyche and prevent you from normal, what is called normal effort you're making to function. Now, that is why now we are addressing this complicated grief thing as much as possible. Complicated grief people also show these symptoms of difficulty in recovering from loss and resuming life. We don't encourage people to resume life in a hurry. We're not saying that. But we'd like to, you know, to have a stride that is moving in the direction of resuming. You have to, because life has also to go on. That reality we cannot deny. You cannot just sit grieving all the time and say, my grief is long lasting, it's complicated, I cannot stop here, and so on. You know? And it becomes a little bit, you know, a process of really not growing anymore, a process of stagnation sets in. And that can be quite, quite bad. Okay, so difficulty in recovering from loss and resuming life. There is a normal difficulty that we normally experience after a trauma experience, after the death in a family. All of us know that. That, but this complicated grief when it prolongs itself and goes on, and you know, that one has to address. And this is why I thought. As we have spoken all evening about grief, and you have brought some useful insights, and you have shared some of your experiences, which I'm grateful for. You know, I just wanted to top it up with this complicated grief thing, so you can carry it home and reflect a little bit. We can pick it up again tomorrow. Intense sorrow and rumination takes place sometimes with complicated grief. Suddenly, uh, people withdraw and start, uh, for example, uh, weeping, you know, they cry for long hours or long stretches of time, or they start ruminating, revisiting the same scenarios that have caused them the grief over and over again. If this were that, if that were this, if I had done that, if this had happened, you know, rumination that is not taking you forward in any way. 
so it is this kind of complicates things and prolongs things you know and there is danger of this kind of numbness setting in this kind of bitterness negativity comes in also bitterness about the loss I mean, all of us know that loss is not pleasant. Loss is painful. That we agree. I mean, no doubt about it. But we need not necessarily become embittered after a loss, such that we cannot then deal socially with others, either in our families or with other people in our communities or in the work situation with our colleagues. Then there is some difficulty there, some problem there. So there is a complicated grief symptoms that are being exhibited by this person, which perhaps needs certain amount of addressing. Sometimes numbness, which is manifest, you know, in uh, like no emotions, you know, you're numb. You ask the person, is this good? You like this kind of food? Oh. You know, no reaction, numb. And it's uh, very difficult for the caretakers or helpers to deal with. Because whatever you do, there's a kind of a numbness, non-emotionality type thing. It's, it's very painful. Because the person is also struggling, you know, he's going through. It doesn't mean the person is deliberately prolonging the gift, and the grief rather, you know this complicated grief and all. No, but he's a victim of this whole thing. And it needs tremendous, uh, you know, reflection and addressing. And one of the key signs of this kind of numbness exhibits itself in, in withdrawal and sleep, you know, long hours of sleep. Any time of the day, I go and sleep, you know. I say, come on now, you know, like life has to go on. You can't get to do things, you know. So then they become very dependent on somebody else as to earn the bread and put food in the table because, you know, I'm now not capable, they're numb. And they withdraw into tremendous sleep patterns. You now you wonder, how can a person sleep like this so much? But they feel it's a need. And this is what will bring cure. This gives me relief, you know, at this time. So good to watch out for these kinds of symptoms. I'm not saying everybody who sleeps a lot has got a problem with grief, but just bear this in mind since you are in this kind of uh, profession and you're trying to help others or help uh, members of the family and so on. And the last comment I want to make for today is this loss of meaning in life. Means life is not, not worth living, so let me go and sleep. You know, that comes the next best thing. I'm not said also sometimes leads to suicidal tendencies. Now it is being exhibited a lot more in the world. Either COVID or other situations are bringing about this kind of responses of helplessness in life, meaninglessness in life. Life is not worth living. You know, so let me go and sleep, let me take my life, let me overdose, you know, these kinds of possibilities of so this complicated grief concept which is gaining ground now i think is some concept you might want to look at because you especially those among you who are younger persons who are you know got many more years as you see myself and not in that category at all but just, i find this kind of thing very helpful very helpful to for our younger people to reflect about, you know, and to see that we don't fall into these kinds of situations of, complica of you know, complicated grief or prolonged grief and so on. So in other words, summary of all this is we should address the issues if we have them or help others who have them, you know, so they start to deal, deal with them because that would be a very helpful thing to do. We will come back to this notion of loss of meaning in life, you know, trying to bring meaning. Because a lot of grief comes when there is no meaning in life. Why should I live, you know? It makes no meaning. It makes no sense, we say in ordinary English. It makes no sense. What do you care? There's nothing to care about, you know? 
So he was kind of morose, depressed, sad, grieving actually. actually. That's what is going on. It's very, very painful. It does a lot of damage to our interior, to our, to our life. We will take this up, uh, you know, tomorrow maybe. Tomorrow I think, no, maybe, definitely. This thing about meaning. Because also now in recent years, four or five years ago, uh, you know, psychologists have come up with this thing of the importance of meaning in life. Before only religious people, religion people would speak about this thing a lot more. Philosophers spoke about it, but in more secular language. But religion people spoke about it more in spiritual language, not only earthly language, but what comes after life type thing. And they try to put meaning in this life. Try to, not always successful. But they try to more than others. But now psychology also begins to see the value of uh, safeguarding meaning in life, giving meaning to people in life, you know, as part of the therapy, part of the building up of the human. Okay? On this hopeful, helpful note, I shall end this evening. I'm very thankful to you, really, for for listening, for asking questions. I'm sorry the net gave some trouble, but that is outside our control. For a while, we have got a top class webmaster, so you can be confident that if you're investing time in this course, it will be well invested because they are taking a lot of trouble to get uh, the thing going, that it functions well, so you don't get frustrated and upset and so on and so forth. Okay? On this note, I would like to wish you a good night, and we will see one another tomorrow. And tomorrow I will explore with you a little bit of Elizabeth Tubler-Ross's theory of stages in grief, which she has moved from stages and death and dying, transferred the concept to grief, that also in grief she believed. But I'll, we'll talk about that tomorrow a little bit. It's quite exciting. Quite exciting. Okay. Good night, and God bless. Good night, Father. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you much. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Father. Good night. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Good night. Very, very night, night. Yes. Night. 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 Yeah. I hope you found it useful. That's important. Very. Yes, Father. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Welcome. Welcome. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night. Yeah.